I love you. Thank you so much for joining us. I have the in-house theologian. Theologian, His name is Dr. David Anderson. And we're going to be studying the Word of God today, so get your Bible. The reason I carry this Bible, my dad gave it to me a long, many, 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 many years ago. And he gave it to me and said, all Bibles should be read. What do you call that, Dave? Is that a, a pun? A double entendre, but a good one? Yeah. Double meaning? Double, double meaning. A sly joke, but a joke with truth. Yeah, but, but it, 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 I don't think they sell it. This is genuine leather. I mean, this is like, this yeah. is not bonded leather. That's all they make Bibles out of now is just that bonded. It's yeah, actually... I really like your leather jacket. That's soft. I, I, would, I would wear that if it had an OU logo on it. I, I want to I I have you guess. How many years have I had this jacket? How many years? Take a guess. 25. Close. 30 really? years. Really? Wow. 30 years ago. It is, it's a nice, yeah, nice soft leather. And, uh, and I'm still wearing it. It's cool in Florida, and that's why he has leather and I have leather on because we woke up this morning and it was, it was in Florida, this would be close to freezing. 52 degrees. <laughs> I did two funerals this week on Monday, and it was the windiest, coldest day in Sarasota we've had in a long time. Yeah. And they were outside funerals. And the wind was just whipping my pants legs as I'm trying to, you could hear the flutter like I a I bet flag. you were glad you had that kind of hair. Yes, I don't mind walking out in the, in the wind at all now. <laughs> yes. I used to always be self-conscious of it and trying to keep the horns coming down. <laughs> now I, I can walk out in a hurricane. I'm a happy man. Same thing with the shower, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dry, dry my hair in like five seconds. Yeah. There's a sadness to not having the hair yeah. there, but it's a lot better than having sprigs. It looks, you look good. You got a good, good forehead. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've heard you say it's, that before. It's, uh, it's kind of glowing in the top, but <laughs> it's like mine is, you know. I used to have hair all the way down <clears throat> here, all the way down there. Can you believe that? Yeah, yeah, I've seen I the pictures. I mean, how, how do you lose that much hair? It's just like, it just disappears. It goes on to heaven ahead of us. It'll be waiting for us when well, we get there. Do, do you realize when people are, are watching this, I will have turned... 82? Yes. And you'll be 82 for a whole nother year. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. But I don't feel like it, Dave. You did one time. Yes. Going up yeah, Rainbow yeah. Falls. Okay. Rainbow <laughs> Falls. In, in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, I climbed with Dave and Brooke, my granddaughter, his daughter, a mountain five miles up. And, and it wasn't, you know, a lot of people think you, you climb the mountain, you know, they got like a pathway. No, this, this was like over logs, big, huge, huge rocks, everything to get to Rainbow Falls, which was a disappointment. If they call that a, a falls, they've got to be kidding. <laughs> My goodness, that, 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 was, that was as much a lie as CNN does every day. Yep. And We're in First Thessalonians <laughs> chapter three. <laughs> That's right. That's right. This is this is our in-house theologian. We're going to talk about that that picture back there. You probably actually on TV you can't hardly see it, can you? You really can't see it. But that's that's Thessalonica, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yes. That's how, what do, how do you say it? Thessaloniki. The, I like that better. Thessaloniki. I'm not sure how they say it over there now. Yeah. It may have been you know modernized yeah. to be Thessalonica. Because that's what everybody from the West calls Somebody it. needs to put a spotlight on that so we can show them, show them what the, that's a synagogue, isn't it? No, it's got a cross on it. That's probably a Greek Orthodox or oh, okay. Catholic or, yeah. Okay, good point, Dave. Boy, you're, he's sharp as a tack. That's why he's here. And that's why I sit next to him and I learn with you. And so take your Bible and, and, and this, this is some of the best Bible study. You know why I love it? Because he actually teaches from the Word. He doesn't, you know, move it over here and go, okay, this is what it says. He, you actually teach from the Word. I strive to do that. The Bible tells us, you know, don't add to his words, lest he reprove, reprove you and you be found a liar. So I try to stay true to what the Word of God says because it's the Word of God and my Word is the Word of David. That let doesn't me, have much weight. Let me bring this up again. Dave's nice car was totaled. <laughs> 
absolutely in a parking lot totaled. I can't believe, I can't believe somebody backing into you from that kind of force. And, and not even, I mean, I barely even felt the impact. It was just a little, a little jolt. And they, but it was the trailer hitch in oh. the back of his truck that went into the wheel well of my car. Oh my goodness. And it, evidently it, was, it just struck it perfectly where it bent the axle and just crushed the wheel well. And because the car was at that, that time only worth about $8,500, they just totaled it. But it was, it was a good looking Genesis. It was a nice car, yeah. Very, very nice driving car. It was a great car. And now you're driving a pickup truck. I'm driving a, a little Toyota 1998 Tacoma. So, so we're trying to take an offering <laughs> that he could get back into a nice car. No, we're not. But no, thank no, you for saying that. But <laughs> just, I, I would just, say that a, a dear viewer who watches from Michigan uh, sent in a contribution to go towards the car, but he, <laughs> he said that God had impressed upon him to do it a few weeks earlier, and he hadn't done it yet. And the, the, uh, I was just the lamenting my yeah. car yeah. Uh, reminded him of it. But it was very sweet yeah. and very thoughtful, and it means a lot when people are generous. It's well, very nice. Well, do you turn down as some auto dealer that, I mean, the guy ha owns the dealership, that he says, I want to give Dr. David Anderson, I love his teaching, a brand new Genesis or, uh, or whatever. W would you turn it down because you don't want to be like these evangelists on TV? No, I wouldn't turn it down. I, I, I embraced the philosophy of Dr. Falwell years ago when somebody asked him if, if uh, he would accept lottery money as a donation to the church. Yeah. He said he's more than happy to do the Lord's work on the devil's nickel. <laughs> so, so if somebody to me if somebody's giving you something yeah. you just accept it graciously and accept it but requesting it's another thing but yeah, accepting yeah. it you, yeah, if, you if God impresses them upon it yeah. you need to accept it graciously you, you understand I'm facetiously saying this okay let's continue chapter 3 verse 1 through 8 of First Thessalonians therefore when we could no longer endure it we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. Now, it's an interesting phrase. We can no longer endure it. He's not talking about persecution. What he could not endure any longer was the uncertainty and the lack of communication between him and that church. He wanted to know how they were doing. Wow. So it's an important point. For true ministers of the gospel... The welfare of those entrusted to them is a priority, more so than their own welfare. A true minister of the gospel is passionate about the welfare of the people they're trying to disciple. And so Paul and Silas... And Do you think you have that? I, um, not to the degree Paul did, but I know it's on my mind all the time. It's why I try to teach the Word of God, because I think that if I want to have a lasting effect on these people's lives, it has to be something greater than me. It has to be something greater than my knowledge or my personality or my personal affection. It's got to be something permanent and real and eternal, the Word of God. So I'm always concerned about, am I communicating it clearly so they can have something to change their lives? Does the thought of possibility of persecution, losing your life, make you more attuned to the needs of the people? Uh, well, if um, I, I'm already in tune with that, let's say, but it makes me sense a greater urgency. For the last four or five years, a lot of my messages have been trying to present to the church, we need to get prepared for difficult times that might include persecution because I've gotten the sense that Christianity has become such a party and such a happy time and such a positive, affluent exercise of Christianity that we are totally ill-prepared for somebody coming in and saying, you can't do that, you can't say that, if you do it, we're going to arrest you. We don't even know how to respond to that. Um, and because we, we never had to really deal with it. And so I feel ur an urgent pressing to at least once in a while get that back in there that the early church dealt with that every single day and they thrived. So we need to find for something deeper than, than the surface things that keep us going as Christians. Like that music was so great, or that project was so fun, or we had twice as many kids and children. Something deeper than that has to keep us going when they take all that away from us and they put you in jail. And, and I'm praying that doesn't happen in our lifetime, but the pieces are falling into place yes. uh, where it could easily, yeah. and the first thing will go will be the free exercise of religion. Our message will be tailored to what they say is no longer hate speech. I mean, look at what this character is signing now for, for all of these 
bills and everything, and, and a stroke of a pen, uh, thousands of jobs were lost. At the stroke of a pen, we could lose our religious rights. Well, those are all very concerning, but for me, the greater threat is what Facebook, Google, and Twitter True. have done. True. They are restricting the free communication yeah. of information. And they've narrowed it down to a politically conservative group, let's say, for now. But the fact they could do that and get away with it and get applauded for it, that has set now a precedent. Anybody, these non-elected people, they're not even politicians, they're not government, they are business people. Anybody that they determine should not have their voice heard, they can silence them. And they can do it and have the culture applaud them for doing and it. You can't that even, is dangerous. And you can't even sue them. You can't do anything. You, you they're, they're immune to all of that. You could sue them, but it's not going to go anywhere. Oh, no, no. They'll keep it in court for a decade, and they'll play. No, you can't even sue them. It, they don't even fall into that category. Oh, that's right, because of the 230, the Section yes. 230 thing. So, but the, hopefully that will change. But to me, that's a concern. The church, that should wake us all up, that the first thing they're going to come for is not our gathering together to worship. They're going to try to restrict what we say. Yeah. And then because we, if we don't comply with that, well, then persecution It's interesting. You went through that in Buffalo, New York, when you had a church there. Yes. Uh, and that was 30 years ago. 30 years ago because you had a stand against abortion and you blocked some clinics. Yes. But it failed because it was proven unconstitutional. And they to the, the judge told you. The, if, it was a federal judge, a district judge of uh, well, Western New York. What were his words? That we could not reference abortion in our sermons because it would be inciting violence, which is the same excuse being used today, that President Trump incited violence. The, the inference that we're inciting violence, well, now it's about um, sexuality. We cannot, or they don't want us to teach biblical principles of sexual morality because it's hate speech towards the LGBTQ community. Well, right now that's still legal, but the, the pattern that's being coming. set yeah. that that will soon be considered literal. Isn't that true literal. in Canada now? I believe so. In Canada? I, at least and, I know and, it's restricted. And I don't the know UK? How, I'm That's not sure how far they take it, but I know it's restricted. All the uh, uh, groundwork is being laid for the silencing of the church's message, and it will start way out here, and some things will say, okay, I can give that up. I can avoid that topic, and it'll, it'll circle yeah, down into finally I'm, the gospel. I know there are people watching right now. I know it as, as, as I know my name that you're saying that is never going to happen. No, no, you guys are way out there. That is never going to happen. What are you going to do when all of a sudden you go 10 years from now or maybe less? They were right. That's what you're talking about. Yes. Preparing the congregation for something other than a birthday party every Sunday. And, and my, my role as a pastor is not to prepare them to political action. To, to prepare them for spiritual depth to withstand the storm that is inevitably coming. I don't have any idea when it's going to come. <clears throat> but I'm not trying to stir them to get up there and revolt and then go vote. Yeah. And I think they should, yeah. but that's not my message. My message is make sure you are grounded in your faith because all the things are outside of your control. And as we saw in this election, it's possible that our votes that we cast didn't really count. Right. So what can we do? We can anchor ourselves in the rock of Jesus Christ and the truth of God's Word and identify ourselves with the early church who were faithful to God when the, when the whole state of Rome stood up against them. So you're, learn, you're teaching what they endured, we may endure it. Yes. And the Bible tells us someday we will. I mean, Christians will face it, whether or not it is in our lifetime or not. But we are certainly closer <clears throat> than we have ever been in my lifetime. We are closer now. And you wonder why Paul sent Timothy. Well, Paul and Silas probably sent Timothy because he was Gentile and he would be less of an irritant to the Judaizers. They wouldn't oppose him because he's already, he's a Gentile anyway. Yeah, yeah. They were upset that Jews were teaching Jews to embrace Christianity and leave Judaism. They wouldn't have cared. I'm, I'm assuming that's why they sent Timothy. And it could have been also because he was younger. Yeah. And, um, well, even Paul himself was killing Christians, right? Uh, before, before he was converted. Yes, because yes. he was a committed Orthodox. They didn't call him Orthodox uh, back then. I mean, they, and, and they, he would go in there and drag them out. Yes, yeah. Persecute until, he, until In fact, he watched, uh, watched uh, Stephen. Uh, Stephen stoned. Yeah. So, so he not only was part of it, he knew that that attitude was still there. And it's not just coming from the Judaizers. It's going to now come from the government of Rome. 
So these two, like, like a vice grip, these two forces are coming on this one little group called Christians. Yeah. So verse 3, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Now this is a powerful uh, statement. That's hard to swallow. He said, I'm sending Timothy to you to encourage you so that you're not shaken in the afflictions you're facing and that you're going to continue to face because you also know that we, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, were appointed to this. Why could you say if, if, if Christ is for us, he's going to stop this from happening. We've got his protection. All we have to do is call upon Jesus. Well, that's, that's the modern Christian theology. It's not the theology of the New Testament. Their theology was get ready to die and die being true to the Lord and, um, and you'll die a martyr. Because yeah, part of the invitation back then wasn't raise your hand if you want to get saved or come to the aisle and we'll have a counselor here for you. It was sign up to be a target of the state. Whew. They knew it. When they became a believer, they were going to be a target of the state and of their religious community that governed their lives, the synagogue. So Paul and Silas here were less concerned about their own afflictions than they were the impact those afflictions would have on the new believers in Thessalonica. Wow, okay. See, what they were concerned about, that the Thessalonians knew that Paul and Silas and Timothy were suffering, that it might discourage them from being bold and brave. And say, I don't want that. Yeah, so he's wanting to let them know, yeah. no, no, God wanted this for us. And then by inference, he, he might be wanting it for you because he knew it was coming. Wow. So Paul and Silas understood and accepted that God had appointed them to suffering. And there are believers today who cannot embrace that one truth. God never appoints anybody to suffering, but he does, he did, and he still does today. Because God's concern is bringing out in us the Christ-likeness, yeah. not making us comfortable. Yeah. That's not God's primary concern up there, wringing his hands over the fact that his children aren't happy. God's desire for us is to be faithful. It's what God, Adam and Eve, cast out of the garden. It was not unhappiness. God gave them everything they could possibly want. It was disobedience. Lack of faithfulness wow. is God's concern. Yeah. So he's building up in us strength of character and virtue and this God-honoring transcendent faith that can pray and sing while you're being executed. Wow. That's the kind of thing that glorifies God. Gratefully, we've lived in a time where we've enjoyed great blessings, yeah, yeah. In at least in America. We've become spoiled. But there have been Christians around the world who, while we're enjoying this, are in jail. Yeah. They don't enjoy this. This yeah. is an American experience. And in, and in free society, this is an experience. But it might not always be this way. Ten minutes. Verse 4. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened and you know. So Paul and Silas did not look for sympathy for their suffering to manipulate the people to give them money or anything. They assured the Thessalonians that God was in control. Wow. So the reason why Paul's bringing this up, he's not saying, you know, we're suffering. You need to send us some stuff or help us or yeah. pray for us. He's saying, I told you we were going to suffer, and I want you to know that so that you know yeah. God is in control of all things, and he will sustain you. Wow. So verse 5. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith. And the endure is not knowing your faith. Yes. Lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. So Paul's paramount concern was the spiritual faithfulness of those he discipled. Wow. And now again, this is discipling to spiritual truth, not loyalty to the church vision not loyalty to the pastor, yeah. not I love my church bumper stickers, yeah. um, not being able to recite the church mission by word for word. It's are you true to the principles of the word of God? Because Paul knows, as you and I know, every, think of the ministries that you and I knew 30 years ago that were prominent national ministries. Yes. Some of them are just gone. gone. They just aged out and they yeah. left. They've been replaced by, nothing in this yeah. world lasts but the truth of the Word of God. And Paul wants them to know that. So the temptation faced by the Thessalonians was to return to Jewish legalism, to announce the gospel, and to repudiate their association with Paul. That's what they were being tempted to do. And they were being argued against by some of the greatest minds in Judaism 
who are sending highly trained rabbis into these towns to pull these people back into Judaism. So it was a powerful philosophical, theological temptation. And Paul was wanting them to know, don't be, don't be fooled into thinking that because we're suffering, we're not in God's favor. Because that's what they were saying. Why would you trust these men? They're suffering. They're being persecuted. They're not, when God has his hand on somebody, they're blessed. That was the argument, even used back then. And, and that would be logical. Well, lo it's, it's logical if you accept the premise that God wants us happy. Then yes, it's logical. But what if God's primary focus isn't he wants us happy? He wants us to love him and be faithful. Maybe suffering is not a sign of God's disfavor. It wasn't for Job. Job eschewed evil, loved God, pursued what was righteous, and God still allowed suffering to come into his life. So suffering isn't always, and I, I'd say more often than we think, not an indication that God is it's unhappy. It's kind of a us. reminder that this really is not our home. Yes. We are aliens here. Yes. And this is temporary. And, 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 you're, and if you're, you're going to stay there forever, you get comfortable. Yes. And, and every blessing you receive here, every good thing should be received with much gratitude and thanks to God, but you have to hold it with loose yes. grips. Yes, yes. Just with Because open it's hand. not going to last. Yeah. And, 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 um, the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon calls it hevel, that everything is vanity, and the word is hevel in Greek. Everything is smoke. Everything is vapor. That you might be able to do that around it, but you can't hold on to it. Yeah. And he was, he was lamenting the fact that nothing lasts. Not riches, not blessings, not possessions, not family, not friends. Nothing lasts. And it was causing him a, an emotional, philosophical crisis. But only he lasts. Only God. That's how he works it out at the end. And he says... Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, wow. for this is your all. Yeah. Well, well, see, Paul. that's the spiritual depth yeah. that Paul is trying to impart to the Thessalonians. So verse 6, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, and we also to, to see you. And this is, a, to me, a powerful reminder that the memory of true fellowship is very powerful when actual fellowship is not accessible. Ooh. When you can't actually truly get with other believers, the memory of what you had with them and the reminder that it still exists even if you can't access it yeah. is very powerful. And, and when, you have, when you have that time, embrace it, right? Yes, because it could go away. It could go away. And you'll be reflecting on it if you're ever in jail or yeah. prison by yourself, secluded from other believers. It'll be the memories of what really exists between you and, and God's children is a great comfort to the soul. And so even Paul said, we were greatly encouraged yeah. when we were reminded, you still love us, you're praying for us, and our wow. fellowship is still sweet. Five minutes. And that's because God designed his children to love each other. It, it is improper for believers not to engage in spiritual fellowship. Wow. That's why writer of Hebrews says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So whether you do it on live stream or in person, we should always be assembling. <laughs> Even in COVID conditions, we should strive to get together with other believers. Verse 7, Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. Faith. So a believer's faithfulness is used by God to encourage faithfulness that, in others. That word faith, same during that time as we... As we apply it today? Yes, yes. It's, it's referencing not only the faith, which is the doctrine of salvation, but your faith, your adherence to it, your belief, your reception of it. That when other people have faith and, and they stick to it, it encourages other believers to do the same. What, what is faith? If you, if you explain faith right now, what is it? Faith is uh, an unrestrained, um, un non-distracted belief in the Word of God which then incorporates, of course, the gospel, the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is all revealed to us in the Word of God. Faith is believing something you cannot tangibly touch and feel and see, but you know it's true. The same way when they turn the lights on today, they, they went and flipped a switch. They don't see the connection between the switch and all these lights, but they know that switch does it, so they flipped the switch. That was an act of faith, whoever turned these lights on today. They can't but, see but they, the mechanism. But they actually didn't know that, did they? No, no, because it's by... I mean, it doesn't hit the mind. No. Oh, I, I exercise faith. But, but spiritual faith is yeah. knowing the truth and living on it, even if you can't see all the connections. You can't see all the wirings. You don't necessarily even see the lights turn on when you flip the switch. 
in biblical faith because sometimes what you're enacting produces something years in the future. It's not always an immediate response, but it always has an immediate truth to it. That ha always have you effective. ever been convicted when something, I mean, horrible takes place and you, you didn't have the faith to believe and you go, I missed that because I didn't know that was coming? Is it, were you kind of chastise yourself for not having faith to believe that would not happen? Oh, I have the same struggles everybody else does when, when anything... And yet you, it happens. When you don't expect it to happen and it happens, or when you're sure something else is going to happen and that doesn't yes. happen, uh, we all have that struggle. But when you realize that God is not as focused on the right now as we are, our focus is always the right now, yes. the immediate outcome. God is planning things light years down the line. I'm, he, he, th these are all pieces yeah. in a beautiful portrait he's painting. It might yeah. look ugly now, but when you step back and see the full picture of your life and Christian history, you'll see this incredible portrait of the faithfulness of God, the faithfulness of His true children, and the glory that goes to God from it. But it's a picture that is only seen when you back up away from it, not when it's right up against your face. So when you go through suffering and trials and tribulations and uh, afflictions and you're down and you're discouraged, you need to ask God to help you step back from it and see the long point of view to the point that Paul wrote in Romans that I reckon or I consider or I've reasoned out that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Amen. So that's Paul immersed in the sufferings he was going through which were severe but he's able to pull himself back and look and see eternity past what was going on right now, and it puts that at peace. So if you are facing anxiety and trauma and fear because of what you see happening in America or what you see happening in your own life or your own family, keep in mind that God is with you every step of the way. The Bible tells us, Jesus said, He will never leave you or forsake you. If you walk into that dark alley, if you go into the ditch, if you go up on the high mountain or in the valley or out to the sea, if you could take the wings of an eagle, David said, and, and fly up into the air, you can go nowhere where God's Spirit is not. Yeah. That is the, the faithfulness. That is the hope. That is the joy of the true believer, not in immediate outcomes, but in the eternal victory we've all been assured we have in Jesus Christ. Because Paul said in Romans 8, neither life nor death nor any other created thing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's true in persecution and it's true in times of plenty, but we need to keep our hearts and minds focused on that truth. Wow. Spend time in the Word of God. He's saying, trust me, come, do it today. God bless you. Bye-bye.